Ladies and gentlemen, coming at you live from paradise. I'm in Hawaii right now, and uh, I was gonna I was gonna watch the Bisping fight, the Bisping Kelvin Gastelum fight live, and uh, do like sort of a breakdown of it while it was happening. But the shit was going on at like two o'clock in the morning out here, and. <sighs> It wasn't happening. I have been eating like a pig and drinking. I've been doing vacation type shit. I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in that you need to do vacation time. You, like vacation time is important. You can't just be working all the time. Occasionally, you have to just fuck off. And so that's what I've been doing. I've just been fucking off. So I, I was tired and I decided I am not going to stay up late. And so I watched it in the morning. I watched it this morning, and I, I've got a couple thoughts on it. First of all, um, Brendan Chobb said this on his Instagram, and I could not agree more. I don't think you should be allowed to fight three weeks after you have a brutal fight like Michael Bisping did with GSP. He got rocked. He got choked unconscious. And then three weeks later, he's fighting a really dangerous Young and up-and-coming Kelvin Gastelum. And Kelvin is a beast. He's got nasty boxing, and uh, that is what he showed in that fight. He hit him with a, a beautiful straight right jab and a right hand behind it. And, oh, my goodness, it was just – that kid is just on fire. He's he's just on another level right now. I'm, I'm super, super impressed with Kelvin. Kelvin has got lightning-fast hands, and he's he's an interesting guy because – He's what I would call a tweener. And what that means is that I don't – I mean I think Kelvin in in the best best of times. Like if, if Kelvin has the best camp and the, the best performance, it's entirely possible that he could beat anybody at 185 pounds. But should he be at 185 pounds? Boy, I don't know because – Chris Weidman is at 185 pounds, and when Chris Weidman got Kelvin to the ground, it really did look like you're talking about two completely different weight classes. And Chris Weidman was able to choke Kelvin out, and obviously Weidman is a former champion, and there is absolutely no shame in losing to Chris Weidman. But it's just the way um, it looked when you were watching the fight. To me, it looked like two different weight classes. And... um, there's a lot of people that think that really Kelvin should be fighting at 170 pounds if he got the proper diet, and he was doing that for a while. Uh, it was, at one point in time, he was uh, – I know Dolce was working with him for a while, and uh, he had his diet in line, and he, he looked fantastic. And then, you know, just things happened, and he didn't want to pay the Dolce money, and uh, – I don't know who he's working with right now as a nutritionist, but I just, uh, I think he's a phenomenal fighter. I just don't know if 185 pounds is, is the right weight class for him. It could be. I mean, it could be that maybe what he really needs to do is just lose some body fat, put on some muscle, and maybe 185 pounds will be his weight class. It's just that constant debate of whether or not you should weaken your body and drop down to the minimum weight you can or whether or not you should fight at a natural weight and have a healthy body. It's, it's a real good argument, and I'm, I'm pausing right now because I'm pulling something up. Uh, there's a girl that just died in Australia. Uh, she died um, very recently. Uh, she was preparing for a Muay Thai fight, and it's just... It's just part of what this sport is about. Unfortunately, it it really bothers the fucking shit out of me. I think it's the scariest thing. Uh, I think, um, yeah, here it is. Teenager dies training. (sighs) Here it is. Um, The the girl's name, she was 18 years old, and uh, her name was Jessica Lindsay, and she died while she was cutting weight. She was an amateur kickboxer in Australia. Um... I cut weight a bunch of times when I was doing Taekwondo tournaments, and uh, it is brutal. It's it's terrible. I, mean, I was bad at it, too. I didn't do it correctly. I just 
worked out real hard the night before and wore rubber suits and the whole deal and dehydrated myself and I didn't rehydrate myself well either so I, I felt like shit the next day when I was fighting and uh, a lot of wrestlers back in the day used to do the same thing um, my weight cut though was nowhere near as extreme as some of the MMA fighters do some MMA fighters I mean they're getting on death's door and uh, I just I just think it's uh, one of the most disturbing and uh, un most unfortunate aspects of MMA. Uh, Kevin Lee said before his last fight with Tony Ferguson that you know he felt like he was he was dying when he was cutting weight, and he made the weight. Habib Nurmagomedov, who's the if not the best, one of the very best lightweights in the world, um, undefeated, had his body shut down last time he tried to make the weight and couldn't make the Tony Ferguson fight. They, they pulled him out and took him to the hospital. I mean, I'm, I'm beating on a dead horse here because it's something that everybody knows. Everybody's aware that it's a, it's a terrible, terrible aspect of our sport. And in my mind, it's contrary to what martial arts is supposed to be about. So in that sense, I encourage Kelvin to stay at 185 pounds because obviously the guy's knocked out Vitor Belford at 185. He just got knocked out. Uh, former champion Michael Bisping at 185 pounds. I mean, he could knock out anybody at 185. But a guy like Chris Weidman, who's very smart about cutting weight, he cuts a lot of weight, but he does it the right way, rehydrates the right way, and he's just a fucking beast. He's just so much bigger. And when he got Kelvin to the ground and submitted him with a head and arm choke, boy, it just really seemed like that's the wrong weight class for Kelvin. And then you see Kelvin, ne next fight, Fights Bisbing and just fucking lights him up in the first round. Now, would he have been able to do that if he fought the Bisping that was training for George St. Pierre? I mean, if Bisping did not have the George St. Pierre fight and just went right into the Kelvin Gastelum fight, would the same result have happened? It could very well have. The way Kelvin hits, he's fast as fuck. His hands are beautiful. He throws really crisp, straight punches. And in... This sport, it's, there's not a whole lot of guys who have crisper, sharper hands at 185 pounds than Kelvin. I mean, he just has beautiful head movement in boxing, and when he moves in for the kill with those hands, whoa! I mean, you saw in the Vitor Belfort fight. I mean, he just fucked Vitor up with those straight punches. And he throws them efficiently, and they have snap to them, and just, and on top of that, he's a very good wrestler. I mean, a lot of people forget how good his wrestling skills are on top of all that. He's just a real threat at 185 pounds. Fascinating thing. Because uh, it's just such a wide-open division. He just called out um, Robert Whitaker, who's the interim champion, of course, and uh, called out Whitaker and wants Whitaker to, uh, to fight him next. But, of course, Robert Whitaker is uh, waiting for the big payday. I would, too, if I was him, to fight George St. Pierre. So it's, uh, it's a wide-open division now that St. Pierre choked out Michael Bisping. And then Gel Kelvin just lights up Bisping. And, of course, you've got to think that Weidman is still in the mix. I mean, even though Weidman lost to Yoel Romero and then lost to Gegard Mousasi, he's still in the mix. Uh, he was winning that Yoel Romero fight, in my opinion, until he got caught with that wicked flying knee. But that's the danger of fighting Yoel Romero. Yoel Romero could do that to anybody in the world. He's just such a fucking freak athlete. Uh, so really, really wide open division. To get back to that fight, uh, I agree entirely with uh, – to get back to the Bisping and uh, Kelvin Gastelum fight. I agree 100% with what Brendan Schaub said that you really have to protect a fighter from themselves. You really can't be letting a guy fight three weeks after an absolutely brutal fight like that. It just does not make sense. It just does not make sense. Um, I don't think it's smart. I mean, I understand the UFC needed someone to fill in and short notice because Anderson Silva tested positive for performance-enhancing drugs, and they did not want to lose the uh, Shanghai main event. So... It turns into an even bigger fight when you've got the former middleweight champion right off of his loss three weeks later fighting again. But it's just not smart. 
I know Bisping wanted to do it. I know Bisping would probably do it again if you asked him to do it. If you, if you asked Bisping to fight in a couple of weeks, he'll probably probably do it again. And and um, someone was talking about him fighting in England, I believe in March, which, phew, boy, I mean, that's less crazy, but still crazy, right? Because uh, we're basically in into December. So you got December, January, February, three months off, really, and then March. But, of course... During that time, he's going to be sparring, and you know, you know Bisping, he's a fucking animal. He's not going to train easy. He's not going to take much time off. And uh, there's a lot of debate as to how much time a fighter should be forced to take off after they get knocked out. And here's the thing about that. You're, you're seeing guys when they're fighting, and you're seeing them getting knocked out, and you're seeing them fighting – you know, X amount of months later. So you saw Bisping. He didn't get knocked out by George St. Pierre, but he certainly got rocked with that left hook. And then uh, he got choked out when he was on the ground. Now, for people who don't know a lot about MMA, getting choked out is not nearly as bad as getting knocked out. It's, there's almost nothing to it. The way to look at it is if you look at a garden hose and you know how you can bend a garden hose and cramp it down. And it stops the water from coming out. That's exactly what happens to your fucking brain <laughs> when you get choked out. When you get choked out, it's basically cutting off the blood to your brain. You wake up and you're fine. You don't have memory issues. You don't have balance issues for the most part, especially if you've only been out for a couple of seconds. Um, it happens all of the time in training. Uh, I've seen many, many guys get choked unconscious. I've choked people unconscious. They come back and they're fine. It's not that big of a deal. But you got to realize before he got choked unconscious, he got hit with a big fucking left hand and hurt. And it was a great fight before that. Uh, both guys were, were giving and taking. Fighters need time off after fights. So you're seeing that, right? You're seeing the actual competition between George St. Pierre and Michael Bisping. But what you're not seeing is how many times he got hit during training. Did he get rocked ever? Did he get clipped and dropped? Uh, did he get... Dropped and hurt and take a couple days off and then get back to training again. Only he knows. Only his camp knows. And most of the times they're not talking. But you hear about it all the time. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Forrest Griffin once. And Forrest was telling me that before he fought Anderson Silva, he was knocked unconscious twice in training. That's fucking crazy. I mean, here he is about to fight the... Greatest pound for pound fighter of all time, next to I mean, if there's there's the, the there's three guys in that debate, right? My my number one guy right now is Mighty Mouse. I think just he he represents the highest skill level, but does he represent the highest competition level in terms of like the guys he's faced? I don't think so. I think number one competition level is John Jones. John Jones has choked out Leota Machida, Rampage Jackson. He's beat Rashad Evans. He beat Alexander Gustafson. He beat Glover Teixeira. He beat Vitor Belfort. He beat Daniel Cormier twice. I mean, fuck. He's beaten everybody. I think you look at competition-wise, John Jones is a very strong argument for the greatest of all time. But Anderson Silva's fucking right there too, man. Anderson Silva in his prime – I think when you look at the way he knocked out Vitor Belfort with that front kick to the face, when you look at the way he fought Forrest Griffin in, in that fight that we were just talking about and, and KO'd him like a magician, the way he fought Stefan Bonner and literally put his back up against the cage. And again, Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin, they're just uh, no disrespect. They're not at the same level as uh, Leota Machida or Glover Teixeira or some of the guys that John Jones has faced. But it's the way Anderson beat them. I mean, Anderson was just in his prime. He was a fucking master, like a real master. Uh, so Forrest Griffin fighting Anderson Silva after being KO'd twice in training camp is just insane. But... These are the things that fighters do when they have to do them. You know, you're talking about a giant payday. You're talking about a big fight. You give the guy a chance. Like, do you want to fight? Do you think you could fight? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I could do it. I could do it. And they go out there and they're compromised and they get clipped and you see it immediately sometimes. Sometimes you see guys, they get clipped and you don't know why. I mean, they get hit with something and look, 
at any any time when a, a person is throwing a punch or a kick at you and it connects, it can put you out. But there's no doubt at all, no doubt about it, that the resiliency of a fighter after they've been KO'd is compromised. There's just no doubt about it. When you see a guy who's been KO'd and then you see them get hit weeks, months later, they cannot take a shot the same way. Their brain is still recovering. Their body is still recovering from the concussion. And uh, you, you have to figure out a way to balance being a risk taker and seizing an opportunity, which is a huge opportunity, versus concentrating on having a long and healthy career. Now, that said, for Michael Bisping, he's kind of at the end of his career. I mean, he said essentially that he wants to fight one more time in England, which would be beautiful for him. And I hope they give him uh, you know, a good matchup. So it'll be a good fight for the fans. And I hope they give Michael some time off. Like, you know, Give the man some time to really relax and then go through a real nice three, four month training camp, get in excellent shape and give his best effort for one more go at it. I would like to see that. But it might be the hardest shit in the world to talk a fighter into retiring. 